Thank you very much that you do have the time to, to meet us here. Uh, I think it's a, it's a perfect opportunity to, to use the time uh, in, in which we are at the moment uh, um, uh, to talk about wine, to, to get some education and everything. So um, we do have had a similar situation that uh, uh, my team was also uh, in the home office for a long time. So Matthias, our uh, sales director, uh, has been six weeks uh, at home and uh, since last week he's back and he's now using this uh, uh, um, tasting room as his office is his uh, um, table in the back so he's getting now a bigger office than me uh, but i agree uh, he's the boss you know <laughs> yes i'm the future <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and I think uh, um, it's, yeah, sorry I have not uh, 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 explained to uh, who we are. I'm, you know, I'm sure you know Matthias more than me, so I'm Philip. So um, the owner of the estate and also a uh, winemaker here. And uh, um, yeah, it's still family business, so of course uh, it's also a family which is working here and, and we do have a team with it's around 10 to 15 people. And we do have now actually the situation that everybody is left to, into the weekend because we have now 6 p.m. and uh, it's Friday night, you know. And here's uh, and me, we are joining now a glass of champagne and going into the weekend and we'll uh, have a nice uh, talk with you. Okay, cheers. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> so, We're all on coffee. <laughs> um, and in general, if there's any questions, so what we prepared is um, we Philip did a quite a nice and funny um, tour uh, through the through the vineyards and the the cellar and everything and the winemaking process, and then we have a classic presentation. And I think this is a perfect setup um, for I don't know how much time you, you guys have, but I think we're good to go in like yeah, 45 minutes or something. Yeah, that's perfect. We allocated an hour, so 45 minutes, an hour is awesome. Yeah. And always, um, I mean, most of you are on mute, so if there's any questions, just raise your hand, and we're gonna trying to, to answer all the questions. So just interrupt us uh, for everything. Um, all right. I guess we just sh should start with the presentation. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Yeah, sounds great. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. This one. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a main presentation which should explain who we are and what we are doing. And of course, organic viticulture is quite important for us. It's nowadays quite dynamic, but the, the start was more than 30 years ago with organic farming. So this is a map of Germany, and you will see the Rhine River crossing uh, the uh, western part of uh, Germany from south to north. Um, and uh, you see um, Rhine-Hessen situated on the left bank of the river Rhine. Um, it's around, uh, West of my village is around 80 kilometers south western of Frankfurt, which is on the other side of the, of the Rhine River. Um, the southwestern part of Germany is climate wise one of the best parts in the country. Um, so wine growing uh, is existing uh, since uh, more than 2000 years. The Romans have cultivated some wine here and uh, our uh, um, situation here is that we do have very interesting soils. It's a big diversity in the region of Rhineland. It's more than 25,000 hectares. Uh, so a lot of different soils, a lot of different subclimates, and also a lot of different qualities which are known in the world. Of course, through the size of 25,000 hectares, we do have also this basic line of, uh, uh, um, yeah, let's say entry level wines, which are not making the region famous at all, but uh, it's existing. Uh, and, but of 
uh, on the other side you have a lot of family uh, owned estates uh, based on quality and uh, I would say in the last 10-15 years our region was uh, the most powerful and uh, um, innovating wine region in, 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 in our country and so we see nowadays a lot of especially dry Rieslings uh, on the map uh, which uh, for the top qualities which are coming from our region. Yeah, um, Rhein is, um, uh, is more looking like an area where it's a region where we talk always about rolling hills. So it means there are not big mountains, uh, but it's also not, not, not uh, just flat. So it's rolling hills, and of course, it's always, there's always a south side and a north side of the hills. And so, of course, the south side is the most important side uh, for um, cultivating wine. So you do have now a view of the um, hillsides of uh, Westhofen, my own town. Uh, Westhofen is uh, one of the biggest wine growing wine villages here, with more than 700 hectares of vineyards. Uh, and uh, it's uh, um, a lot of tradition here, uh, mainly focused on white wine varieties and also a big focus on Riesling. And one of the most important things in uh, Westholt is the soil characteristics, which give a lot of text change to the wine. It's limestone undercrop, it's very chalky soils, and you could feel this in the wines because you always get the kind of saltiness in the aftertaste, which is really coming from the soil types. Yeah, of course, as I told you, it's family business. My parents uh, um, are still uh, uh, helping me, even uh, they have uh, retired and say that they're not responsible to take all the decisions anymore. But uh, for sure, my father is helping me enormously uh, in the vineyards uh, as, as a kind of vineyard manager. And my mother is still doing administrations and she is still responsible for finances. So um, she is still uh, the boss of that state, if you want, like, if you have any like, he has to stop him because if he has some financial problems, he has to go to her, not to me. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, there is uh, uh, Eva, my wife, and me. Eva is owning uh, and running her own estate at the Mosul Valley, which is 150 kilometers away from here. Um, and uh, um, it's luckily only a small estate, it's five hectares, but Amazingly, de amazingly developed in the last uh, decade, uh, also on the map for high end qualities. And, uh, but we are living here in, in, in Rheinhessen, not, uh, in Westhofen, and she's also helping here in our estate. And me, I'm responsible at the end for everything. I have, I have uh, especially to be the team manager uh, in, in the first moment to organize everything uh, at the estate. Uh, but I'm also responsible for the vineyards and for the, for, for the cellar. And at the end, uh, um, beside a few tiers also for the sales. So um, it's really a family business, but teamwork is, is important. So uh, it's 10 to 15 people here at the, the estate who are helping me enormously. And Matthias and my cellar master are the most important ones. Uh, because they do have also their own part where they take decisions. Yeah, that's a little, some impression of the estate, but you can see more when we look at uh, the little film we had for, produced yesterday. And another important information is that uh, the variety uh, 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 cultivation is uh, organized like this that Riesling, Riesling, and Riesling are the main varieties, so it's uh, more than. Uh, percent uh, of the plants uh, and followed by the Pinot family, the Burgundy family, mainly Pinot Blanc, but also some Pinot Gris, some Chardonnay and also Pinot Noir is planted here. And yeah, it's, 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 it's organic farming, it's biodynamic bi farming since 2004 and maybe we will talk a little bit more about this later. Yeah, the map uh, of, of Westholm, so you see all these colored uh, parts of the map uh, planted with vineyards. Uh, we do have an easy classification system. It's uh, um, regional wines or, or wines which are named by the estate name. Then we do have the village wines, 
Then we do have a premier root class called Astralago, and then we do have a Congo class called Osala. And for sure, uh, you have heard about uh, the Osalago wines in the dry version. They are called Osalago, which means GG in short. Uh, this is the main uh, pop class uh, uh, part of wine we produce. And we have developed also uh, the second part of pop class wines in the premier category. And these wines are named as Astralago. And we have decided in our region that we do use the village name in combination with uh, Astralaga to say this that this is a premier group and not the single vineyard name. So, uh, Westhofen Astralaga wines is similar to a wine like Chambol Musini Premier Cree. There you also have the village name and the premier Cree status, uh, and we do exactly the same. We have decided to go in this direction because otherwise, we should have to bring another 30 vineyard uh, uh, names on the map, and this would confuse everyone and nobody would be helped with this. So, um, our job is to produce uh, Premier Cru wines in a very serious quality, and the naming is organized uh, in the way that we use the village name to make the village names famous, actually. Yeah, so. At the end, yeah, you see again, this is a paramount uh, about the classification. We did be good spine, we did be all spine, which means, which means uh, village, and then the premier cruise, we did be aus ersten Lage, and we did be große Lage, the concrete part. And uh, yeah, biodynamic farming since 2004, uh, organic farming since uh, uh, certified since 1990, so this year we celebrate 30 years of organic farming. Um, at the end, it needs a lot of network, and uh, we are always focused on quality, on biodiversity, and uh, it's uh, important for us that we do have a perfect growing balance in our winters. So especially the biodynamic uh, farming is everything about uh, um, growing balance. And this means actually that through this better growing balance of the plants, we do have actually longer hanging times of the fruits in the vegetation period and in the end better qualities. And I could say this after 15 years of biodynamic farming comparing to organic farming, but you can't say it from the one year to the next. It's a longer process and if you want we could uh, go in, uh, further in it, but uh, maybe we will first have uh, to check uh, the, the little film that you get more impressions about how it looks here. Uh, yeah, vintage 90, I would say let's do talk about this uh, in, in short way because you, as, as far as I know, you just received the 18 vintage right in here. So, so 19 will come later. It was again an uh, amazing vintage, a little bit later in development of the vegetation than 18, which was quite early, uh, but again, perfect healthy fruits, good weather conditions, and uh, great expression of the terroirs. So we are quite happy with 19. Unfortunately, it's 30% less on in quantity compared to, to 18, but uh, amazing vintage. And to 18, I could say, it's of course, it's a big vintage, and in, in, every, in every case, so it's of course it's also uh, a warm vintage, but I think we have arranged in a very good way that we have elements, we have uh, freshness uh, and purity, and uh, yeah, we are quite happy with 18. Yesterday night we just received a new Parker point, for example, and uh, the estate really got 92 points, which is amazing to see that our basic uh, uh, assortment uh, will be rated like this. But it's the expression of for the situation that the vintage is really a big one. Yo, now going to the wines you to get in your market and maybe Matthias will take. Yeah, so you you guys we have you, we're starting with the hundred hills, um, which is you know as Philip said, many people talk about Van Hessen and ourselves we talk about Van Hessen as the line of the rolling hills of the thousand hills and um, the hundred hills. Uh, for us, is a is a really nice uh, entry level riesling, which is 
more fruit driven, which is a little bit more easy drinking, which is dry as well. Um, and it's sourced from around Westhofen from different villages and it's 100% organic as well, which is, which is really important for us. Um, the winemaking is pretty much um, similar to the rest of what we, what we really take care of is that we don't, that we're not talking about any botrytis um, berries in our dry style wines, which we mainly at like 99% produce um, and it's fermented in, in stainless steel to get the freshness, to get the fruitiness. Um, and we do it as a Pinot Blanc style and a Riesling style, um, but for yeah, for, for the Western Canada, you just purchase the, the, the Riesling, which is uh, I think a great example of how entry level Rieslings from, from Rheinhessen and especially from Germany can taste like. Um, and then we do have the estate wine. So estate wine is all the grapes come from 100% uh, estate grown fruit. Um, so there's no purchased fruit. Um, and it's all biodynamic, as Philip said. And um, what you have in the market right now is the 2018 estate Riesling. Um, just, we just received, as Philip said, those 92 points from Parker, which is quite nice. Uh, but at the end, you know, it's, the wine has to taste good. It's, uh, the, the points is nice to have, but if the people don't like it, yeah, <laughs> it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't make you more happy as if the people are drinking it. Um, and we're talking about two-thirds of big oak cast and one-third stainless steel for the estate Riesling. We crush the grapes um, for about two to six hours, depending on the vintage. And then we ferment 100% with um, indigenous seeds. But Philip, in the movie we're going to show you, we talk a little bit more about wine making. Um, and then we're coming to the Pinot Noir, uh, what you have in the market as well. So in Germany, we call it Spätburgunder. Um, and uh, for the last couple of years, we're putting a lot of effort into the Pinot Noir. Um, we do it, it's a really traditional way what we're doing it. So we're doing we're fermenting it on the skins, the stainless steel vats, and then we put it in, in French oak casts, so really 228 liters, um, and keep it there for about, uh, depending on the vintage, yeah, 16, 18 months. Um, there's no fining, there's no filtration, so really, classic, really elegant style of Pinot Noir. And because it's, it's grown on limestone soils as well, I think um, it's a perfect example of what Germany can do on the one hand, not only Riesling as, as well as in Pinot Noir as well. And uh, 2017, pretty cold vintage and, and really elegant vintage and a great example for, for Pinot Noir I think, from Germany. Um, and then we're coming to the to the Premier Cru site that we talked about. So all the gray stuff you see on the map, um, this is Premier Cru site. So what, what the BDP did was classifying um, single vineyards and putting them together as the Premier Cru sites. The, the darker blue spots, this is the, the Grand Cru, the Kirschspiel, what you have in your portfolio as well, which is more on the right hand side of the map. Um, and, the, and the gray part, this is where Westhofen could come from. But actually what we do, the Westhofener Riesling uh, comes from 100% Morstein. So at the end, we were talking about three different Premier Cru wines we're doing. Uh, Gundersheimer Riesling, uh, which is a little bit further west from, from Westhofen. The Westhofener, what you have in your portfolio, and Mirsteiner Riesling. So it's three different Premier Cru wines. Uh, but Westhofen is actually, yeah, our, our hometown. This is our, what we're doing for, for years and years. Um, and Westhofener comes from 100% Moorstein Konkul vineyards. So it's actually, it could be called a Konkul, but we're really strict in what goes into the Konkul for Moorstein and what goes into Westhofener. And for the winemaking, we're talking about 100% uh, really old, but oak casts. So no stainless steel and, and uh, indigenous yeasts for sure as well. And this is, I think, a, a great example of, of really limestone driven Rieslings. Um, the aging potential is enormous um, and it's a great way of showing what this village and what this area here is about. Um, as well, uh, the Kronkruis stuff. So in, in uh, Westhofen, we're really we're, we're one of the few villages in Rheinhessen where we can say we have, we're talking about four classified Kronkruis sites. Um, and it's actually divided into two parts. There's, on the one hand, there's Aulerde and Fischbiel. And on the other hand, there's Brunnenhäuschen and Morschwein. But uh, in the movie, we, Philip will talk about that in a little bit more into detail. And I think this is uh, 
uh, even more interesting than, than showing some pictures. And yeah, these are just um, some ratings of the wines, 2018 Aulerde, 2018 Kirchspiel, what you just received. Uh, that's what you have in your portfolio. Um, and then we're talking about the Brunnenhäuschen, Kronkru and Morstein Kronkru, probably the most, the most famous of the four Kronkru's we were doing every year. And yes, Lavon auction wine, uh, really special, <laughs> really small quantities, uh, comes from Morstein as well, but uh, different story. Yeah, fashion. <laughs> Uh, one, a quick look into the cellar, but we're going to see it in the movie as well. So, and uh, before we will start the movie, two things. First, uh, this movie is really handmade yesterday afternoon, so uh, it's not uh, getting uh, bought yet. Please see it's just uh, produced, but. Uh, our friends in Australia this morning, if you tonight will see something about uh, our drinks. So um, please understand this. And secondly, which is more important, um, if you have any questions now, we should talk uh, about it. <laughs> no Oscar material now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> but it's funny, so. <laughs> any questions so far for you guys? Matthias, uh, the Hundred Hills um, label, is that a new label across right. the board? Right, there's someone paying attention, very good. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have decided uh, to change the label. Um, I have to explain it a little bit. Um, we started with Hundred Hills uh, um, in uh, 2008, um, and I was very much influenced by this uh, nice guys from Australia where uh, all these estates have their second label which was more funny label was a little bit more lifestyle and, and uh, yeah, yeah and so we started uh, with some films in this time and then we have done uh, a few times uh, um, a little change and we have been coming to the result in the discussion of the last year that it would make sense to bring it closer uh, to the estate um, nowadays because the use of the wine is getting different nowadays. It's usually the wine which is used for the wine by the glass situation in the restaurants uh, because it's also price wise and quality wise something which is working quite well in this. And that way it makes sense that we do work with a label which is a little bit closer to the estate label and therefore we decided to go to this. So that'll be new as the 2019 vintage. Exactly. Okay. It's, it, I think it's 19 vintage uh, new in 18 not yet. Yeah. So let's start uh, the, little, the little movie, I guess. Yeah, Terry just had a ah. question about the La Bonne auction wine, right? Um, so the auction wine is the way it is done uh, is limited to the BDP producers, right? And, and uh, most famously, it comes from the Mosel Valley and the Rheingau. But um, we're in Rheinhessen together with Naha, Pfalz, and the R area. And we're doing our own auction as well every year. So actually, the BDP Germany, they do have three different um, yeah, uh, stuff going on for, for, for auction wines from the BDP. Um, and you can only buy it and, and will be only auction on the BDP auction. Uh, every year. Okay. Um, is that online or is it like a an event? Now it's last year. I think we started with kind of a phone call auction as well. I can't really remember, but actually it's it's offline. Yeah. <laughs> so people. So it's it's not really a classic. Yeah, maybe it's, it's too much information now, but it's not really a classic auction where everybody can bid. Um, so there are middlemen who, who bid for you as a private customer or as a retailer or importer. Um, and you tell us your maximum price you want to pay for each bottle. Um, and then it's, it's a little bit more complicated than a normal auction. 
But for sure, if you're interested in, we can we can go for it. All right, I'd say we, we start with the vineyard tour. Hi, welcome to our vineyard tour. So we would like to show you the differences of our sites and we will start with the vineyards of Aulerde and Kirchspiel. So if you look straight ahead on the south face slope, this is uh, the Aulerde vineyards. And if you have a view to your left where it's east faced, these are the Kirchspiel vineyards. So very close together, both sides but very different in taste if you taste the wines. We will explain you why when we are closer on the vineyards. So here we are in the middle of the Aulerde vineyards. And um, yeah, it looks good at the moment. I'm quite happy with everything. Growing is quickly and uh, let's say it's another four weeks to the flowering. flowering. And so we are hopeful with good weather conditions that uh, everything is going in the right direction. So, and we will, I will show you our oldest wines in the Aulet where we get always concrete qualities. It's starting here in this vineyard. So on the right. Now we have a direct view on to our oldest vineyards in the Aulet, planted in the beginning 50s of the last century. So we do get very low yields here, but therefore amazing fruits. And uh, it's always very little bunch with very small berries, but quite intense. And as you see, it's a lot of wines per hectare. So it's uh, planted more like in Burgundy than it's uh, typical for the Rhine Valley at the moment but this gives a lot of quality. And from here we go straight ahead to the Kirchberg area. So we have just to cross the Aulerde vineyards. We could have a view on the, on the right and also on the left side. These vineyards on the left are also owned by us, but here we do produce uh, more uh, easier qualities because the wines are just younger. So, and from here on, you could also have a view to the left and you see perfectly the side of Kirchspiel, which is east faced. So more st steeper slopes uh, and much more chalky texture in the wines because it's a lot of limestone rock in the underground. And here we are, one of our tractors is driving. It's still opening the soil. So, And of course you should know that uh, Westhofen is one of the biggest wine growing villages uh, of the region uh, of Rheinhessen and this means of course there are a lot of different growers who are owning uh, vineyards here and therefore of course the systems are quite different so not every vineyard looks wonderfully and not every vineyard is bringing good quality so it's a lot of differences at all. Here we go, we are now on the border from Aulerde to Kirchspiel and we go directly through the Kirchspiel area. So um, on the left side you could see old Kirchspiel plants. So here this vineyard it's uh, grown also in the 70s from in the 70s planted and uh, giving us wonderful qualities too. Um, this uh, special place in Kirchspiel is, is, is very preserved because there is no wind from west, no wind from, from the north, so a, a, a more warmer place of, of uh, the Kirchspiel vineyards. But we do own several places in Kirchspiel, so this is one part, the warmer part, and the underground very chalky and very limestone driven. So then we have to go more ahead. Drive a few meters and we'll come back to you. Yeah, 
Yeah, we are now in the Kirschspiel vineyard. So you see it's steeper slopes here. It's east faced and uh, if you have a view on the beautiful soils, it's special uh, because of this. So um, we talk about limestone, of course, also little stone on the top, but also in the underground, it's limestone rocks. And this gives a very salty texture to the wines of Kirschspiel. And um, through this uh, east facing situation, uh, it's uh, uh, also special in aromatics. So uh, you never get these very yellow fruit driven aromatics in Kirschspiel. It's more green, herbal, spicy in its aromatics because there is no later evening sun. Of course, early morning sun is there, but in the evening it's getting colder here, which is interesting for, for, for the texture of the wine. And if you have a view in the back, you could see the Aule Erde vineyards, which are more in the valley. It's warmer there. It's heavy clay, so it's less limestony, but therefore very yellow fruit driven wines through these good climate conditions. So the most charming and beautiful Rieslings are produced. Uh, in so we shortly do arrive in the Brunnenhäuschen vineyards on our right side. You can see the color of the soil of Brunnenhäuschen. It's more red colored and this is because there is a lot of iron in the soil and of course it's again limestone base but a lot of iron too and this gives an extra texture to the wine. It's more creamy through this um, but of course you also get these lengths and limestone the saltiness uh, which is quite typical for Westhofen in general. And this vineyard uh, is um, on an altitude of 240 meters uh, on the top and is also more late in the development. And uh, you could also see that the growing is a little bit uh, slower than in the Aulerde and Kirschspiel. So uh, it's less green than in these uh, other vineyards. But uh, no matter at all, we do have a lot of time. In Moorstein vineyard. So if you have a look at this beautiful place. This is the Moorstein. So this is uh, the main block where we grow our GG wines. It's old wines, it's heavy clay topsoil and the underground is full of stone material, big rocks, limestone, very chalky, which uh, give, is giving the texture of Moorstein. Typical for Moorstein is that you always get this nice west wind which is blowing here. You would also see it here on the grass, that it's always windy. And this is helping to keep the fruits healthy for a long time. So we always have a long vegetation period here. And of course, again, the attitude uh, is interesting. We are here now on a, a level of 200 meters. And so it's perfect for the situation that the fruits are getting ripe year by year, but it's always uh, growing slowly. And we have this big advantage of yeah, Nordic climate conditions for crispy and uh, uh, um, uh, spicy white wine texture. Yeah, oh, another interesting point is uh, the, the big uh, mountain in the back. This is called uh, the Donnersberg and uh, the Donnersberg is very much influencing our weather conditions here. So we are a bit in the rain shadow of this mountain, which means that the, the clouds are going more far south or far north and we get less rain here. So this is a big advantage in general for biodynamic and organic growing because we have less problems with diseases. But of course, in dry seasons, it could also mean that we wait for the next rain. Luckily, here in the underground, we do have enough water because uh, we do have uh, really sources in the underground. And uh, in wet years, we struggle a bit through this. But in the, in the dry seasons, we come perfectly through. We go now into this vineyard and I will explain you a little bit about the soil. Yeah, as you see, a lot of different things are growing here. It's uh, a big diversity usually. Of course, unfortunately, in this season, uh, we have to open the soil quite early because of the dry weather conditions. So uh, this means that we have uh, not everything uh, green at the moment, but uh, uh, luckily we get a lot of mineralization through this uh, opening of the soil. And if you see the soil, it's, it's quite healthy. And you could see this is how hard it is. It's 
really heavy material and you could see it's very very I can't open it it's quite hard but it's it's a heavy clay topsoil and you see there's a lot of mineral things between and um, of course again you do see all these chalky things and uh, beautiful old wines and so it's just uh, in the beginning springtime you could see the little fruits are growing up here and uh, it means we have to work a lot to bring it to ripeness this year but we are full of hope and we expect a good season here we go Hölnbrand, neighbor village gundersheim we do own vineyards here since now six years we have new plantings here and we have a gundersheim riesling and a gundersheim spätburgunder both uh, classified as premier crew levels but i expect that gundersheim will bring us gg Grand qualities in long terms because the underground is wonderfully stony as you see is these big rocks are typical uh, for our underground also in the Westhofen vineyards so when I talk about limestone rocks if you see these rocks you could imagine what I mean and uh, so uh, crazy good material giving a lot of saltiness into the wines of course our wines are younger here in Gundersheim so it needs some time for develop it to the maximum quality but I'm quite hopeful and at the end, if it's happening in the next generation, I could also live with. Yeah, that's it for the vineyard tour. We go now to the estate and have a look into the cellar. All right. Any, any questions? Quite windy in the rain today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I noticed a bunch of the wind turbines in the background. Did you have a like a constant windy situation in the vineyard? Depending where you where you're standing, yes. But I mean, yeah, it just doesn't look like nice. But for sure, it's it's good for the for the for for all the energy producing. So, uh, but yeah, it's hard, you know, when you're such a scenery. With all the all the vineyards and having all these soup games in the back, it's yeah. For the photo shooting, it's not it's not a perfect uh, environment. Good. Let's let's do have you in, uh, into the wine cellar. Uh, no more questions. Or? So we are now on the way to our pressing house and the wine cellar. Both buildings are the oldest part of the estate. And uh, we have to cross our beautiful garden on the way. Of course, it's a little bit crazy that we have to cross it also with the fruits and also with the bottled wine to the warehouse. But um, it's because of the traditional growing of the estate. It's happening just like this. So and uh, maybe we could stop here in the garden and you have a look can have a look around how it's looking here um, and i will explain you a little bit about our estate so um, of course it's a long history we are named first uh, in 1663 here in westhoven as wine growers so a long tradition and um, all the buildings here are built mainly in the 50s of the last century expect of the pressing house and the cellar which is from 1900 and 1829 yeah um a few informations about the estate uh, we grow uh, wines on 30 hectares it's a family business with we have, we do have a good team so in total we are around 10 15 people working here of course plus uh, the helpers, uh, seasonal helpers uh, for the picking and all these things. So um, all the vineyards are farmed biodynamically since the vintage 2004 and everything is done organically since the end of the 80s. So it's uh, more than 30 years of organic farming now here. Of course, a lot of handwork, 
we try to work as exact as possible. The idea is producing perfect fruits in the vineyard. Uh, and then we handle everything quite careful and gentle to keep the quality of the fruit and bring the texture of the soil and the vineyard and the climate into the bottle. That's the main idea. Now we are in the pressing house, which is also used as bottling hall. We do have a mobile bottling line together with another estate, so we could drive it in and out as we need it. But of course, uh, main use is uh, this uh, room for, for the pressing of the fruits. So all the vineyards are picked by hand in half season for sure, because we would like to be very selective and uh, we do not like botrytis fruits. So it's important for me that we pick everything very healthy and uh, therefore we also do have a sorting table at home at the estate. So when the fruits are coming in, uh, we check everything again on the sorting table, then it's carefully crushed and then we do have short skin contact times between two and six hours, depending on the vintage. Then we drive the fruits in boxes down here into the pressing house and uh, skip by forklifters on the presses. Very gentle, very careful. And as you see, it's three presses. It is a lot for an uh, estate in our size. But for me personally, the press is a very important uh, uh, machine. It's, you could use it like a music instrument. You could play it in a very different way. And I, my personal idea is, I would like to have a very puristic texture and taste. So I would like to avoid phenolics as good as possible. But uh, I would like also to have the characteristics uh, of, 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 of the, the fruits uh, into the juice. And therefore we do press very long terms, but very static and gentle. And through this, uh, we do reach uh, this, this goal. And we do not find the juice. We do not, do not add anything. We just have a natural sedimentation in the stainless steel tanks and then it's running down by gravitation for the fermentation. That's it. Very easy uh, system, but uh, important is uh, to do everything very exactly. And now we go down into the cellar and have a view to the cellar. This is the key for the wine cellar. So it's really a, a, yeah, a big size, old, but still working. So. And here we are. This is the big wine cellar. Still the heart of the estate, built in 1829, six and a half meters down into the earth, very good climate conditions uh, all year long, so perfect for storing wine and uh, so uh, a very important place for our quality management actually. As you see, we still believe in the big wooden cast, which are still in use. Um, this is important for our style of wine. So everything is fermented naturally with spontaneous yeast, so we do not add any commercial yeast. This means checking fermentation day by day. I do not like to have a fermentation which needs too long time, so let's say averagely 30 days uh, for fermentation is fine. So uh, if it's longer, it would mean that you lose texture, straightness, acidity, and the wine is getting more creamy. And I would like to avoid this. I like this idea of pure and straight and elegant uh, texture of these limestone-driven wines. So therefore, uh, I would not like to have malolactic for our white wines. And therefore, it's important that fermentation is going quickly through. Yeah, of course, the big wooden casks are helping for this. You have a good isolation of the oak and the uh, temperature is quite stable. Uh, yeah. After fermentation, we do not drag the wines. We keep it on the full lease. 
uh, and uh, just sulfur in small amounts to have everything stable. Um, and then uh, we wait for natural uh, sedimentation and uh, clearing. And of course, in winter time, when tastings starting in February, March, for the blending decisions for the basic wines and the bottling of the estate wine of the basic ones are usually in spring, so let's say March, April, and uh, then we, we do bottle the village wines in May, June, and the so single vineyards, premier cru and Congress end of summer. So this means longest uh, time on lease is for single vineyards eight to ten months. I personally think that's for me the maximum I like because otherwise I do lose elegance again. We of course we have uh, played a little bit with these things, but um, I prefer to, to have it like this. We have shown that uh, our wines are very very good for, 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 for aging and so there is no plus for me to have a longer vinification time in the cask. Um, of course, it's different to the Burmese varieties, which we also grow. So we, we do have 70%, 70 to 80% Riesling, followed by the different Burmese varieties, mainly Pinot Blanc, a little bit of Pinot Gris, Chardonnay. And these wines are sometimes longer on the lease, especially the reserve qualities. They do have a second winter in the cask and on the lease. And this means more creaminess, more intensity, which is helpful in our northern climate conditions for sure. Yeah, let's have a little view uh, to our red wine cellar. Just follow me and watch your step. It's a little bit slippy down in the cellar. the wine cellar which is built in the middle age so um, different climate uh, which is quite helpful here we do store reserve qualities of Chardonnay which are uh, fermented and stored in the barrels and here we do have these classic 600 liter casks where we store Pinot Blanc for reserve quality and we do have also uh, uh, 20 months or something like this in the cask. And in the next cellar, the bigger cellar, we do store our Pinot Noir. Of course, I could say this is a hobby room because that's the total amount of, of, of production we do have for, for, for Pinot Noir, for Spätburgunder. Um, we try to produce this wine as serious as possible and we see more and more success and we see also more and more international interest in these German Pinot Noir qualities. Climate change is helping in this case, to be honest. And of course, our limestone driven soils are perfect for Pinot too. And so we are on our way for producing a single vineyard Pinot in long terms. At the moment, we're producing an estate Pinot Noir and a village or a reserve quality uh, depending on the year. But in the Höllenbrand vineyards in the neighbor village Gundersheim, my idea is to produce a GG in long terms, but I think it needs some time um, to develop this because the wines are still young. Yeah, okay, that's it of the cellar tour. Let's go up to the tasty room and taste some wines, maybe. All right, unfortunately, no tasting this morning. I say cheers to you. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> What are you drinking? Oh, it's a nice bottle. It's a uh, Bollinger 2008. Uh, um, not the wrongest one, but unfortunately, you know, we have drunk in it. <laughs> 2008, good vintage. Yeah, it's amazing. Definitely. A little bit too young, but it's all right. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's Friday night for us. So, unfortunately, I do have. Uh, uh, Another a little bit more, not a uh, less relaxed uh, um, event tonight. I do have a, um, a tasting with other German uh, gastronomic people, journalists, however, which will be sent live on Facebook. So if you would like to join, we have just that 
Google it. Um, but it means two hours of talking about wine. And I thought it's better to have some uh, champagne before to be more relaxed, you know. <laughs> yeah, do you have any questions about uh, our doings here? You're talking about a GG Pinot Noir. Um, what sort of time frame are you thinking on that? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but let's give me another five years. Right. And GG, that designation can be used for any varietal? Or is no, it just Riesling and Pinot Noir? Just Riesling and Pinot Noir. Just these two, two varieties. Hmm. The best ones, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, cool. Well, team, anybody else have any other questions? I think Christopher had a question here. There is ten years in Washington. What about Kirschbill? Yeah, Kirschbill uh, has even around similar situation. Also around ten serious producers. Um, and Kirschbill, from the VP point of view, it's Gröbe, Keller, and Wittmann. And there is also a Trice Tracker, which is interesting. And uh, I don't know who else. So maybe three, four interesting producers, uh, in my point of view. Kirschbill is a smaller site uh, in point of quantity of, 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 of the square meters. Um, Morstein is Actually, um, it's big, and there are a lot of uh, growers uh, owning a piece of Moorstein, but uh, only the little part where the best fruits are growing. It's this is limited, and I would say the main ones are Keller and Wittmann at the moment, who are owning their, their vineyards in there. What's the uh, what's the production levels for the Hundred Hills? Uh, and maybe for the estate reason as well? So, um, we do produce around 80,000 bottles. Sorry, I know you are always talking about cases, but uh, we talk about bottles. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, it's 80,000 bottles of, of 100 hills, averagely. Um, it's between 60,000 and 100,000 bottles of estate Riesling, very much depending on the uh, yields of the vintage. Um, and uh, it's between 10 and 15,000 bottles of Westhofen Premier Cru. And all together for the four composites, it's between 15 and 25,000 bottles for all four sides. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Do you have a difficulty in controlling uh, your yield or uh, is it naturally limiting? This is very much depending on the vintage, you know. We, we are struggling in the way that everything could happen through these climate changing situations. We nowadays do have very warm vintage, but we have to pay attention that not, nothing is getting overripe. And we still have these classical old uh, temperatures in other years where we have to fight to bring the fruit in the right ripeness. But we maybe also have to do some tree harvesting and everything. So through this, um, the yields could change year by year. And the most difficult thing for us is to decide on the right moment what to do. Because you never know what will happen climate-wise in the next eight weeks. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Anyone else? <laughs> okay. 80 and 70 vintage comparing, yeah, interesting. Um, a lot of similarities, um, but the main difference is that 18 was the weather was more extreme than 17 
and uh, um, it was more fight to keep overripeness uh, low and to, to, to bring it on the, on the right balance. Um, but actually, second hit was also a warm year. So, uh, and I would also say we learn year by year managing these things. Um, and in 17, we have had a very regional uh, uh, um, happening, which was uh, unnice, and this was a hail uh, in, in late summer. So 17 for us at the estate was much more difficult because we have lost a lot of yields and we also have to be much more selective when we have harvested than in 18 where we picked the healthiest and nicest grapes I ever have seen. Okay, no. Then I would say um, we, we we made it, and uh, I hope that uh, we have had the chance to, to give you the right impressions about our doings here. I personally think that uh, um, it uh, um, makes sense to do meetings like this more often than it was in the past. We just have learned that it makes sense. Uh, um, so maybe Matthias is a little bit boring, but he. He's not traveling as much as he has done. Uh, we will see. And I know that everybody is yeah, not knowing what, will, what the future will bring to us. I wish you all the best for the reopening and the restart. And uh, let's hope that we will have the next meeting uh, in the same good, healthy conditions. And uh, uh, hope that uh, we will win the, the challenge against the virus. <laughs>